Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today we're going to read some Fenwick Holmes. He was the brother of Ernest Holmes. He wrote an amazing book called The Law of Mind in Action that has a number of amazing teachings in particular. We are going to talk about the one law we need to know. This law of mind as described by Fenwick Holmes is a powerful teaching on the laws of attraction or the law of assumption if you consider those two things different. I'm always interested by new thought authors and the way they taught the law with great simplicity and power and I always find powerful nuggets and bits of information from these older teachings. The one law we need to know. There is one law supreme to this system of life. Sometimes we call it the law of cause and effect. Sometimes we speak of it as the method by which spirit passes into manifestation. Psychologists frequently speak of it as the law of suggestion. Every teacher of metaphysics spends his time either in giving his interpretation of it or in explaining some truth that is related to it. Our happiness and success in life are measured by the degree to which, either consciously or unconsciously, we are obedient to the requirements of this law. It is the law that we cannot break, but we can be broken by trying to break it. It is the law by which, as ye sow, ye also shall reap. Through it, it shall be done unto you according to your faith. It explains why, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. It is the basis of the law of correspondences. It is the activity of creative mind, neither good nor bad, by which we create our own heaven and our own hell. It is the secret of all tragedy and all comedy. It is the touchstone to truth. And he who knows it and employs it wisely is the emancipated soul and a master on the path. Let the student therefore learn the following principles which constitute the law that through the knowledge he may obtain the mastery of fate and control the conditions of life and destiny. For no less a power is in the hands of him who learns and wisely employs this law. All must use it because we live by it, but how few use it wisely. The Law 1. The first principle of this law is that of the universal presence of intelligence, that we live, move, and have our being in a vast sea of life, both invisible and visible, that this intelligent life is not only around us, but is in us. Even more, it not only is around us and in us, but it is the substance as well of which all things, including our bodies, are composed. This statement is supported alike by revelation, as in the Bible, by science, as in psychology or chemistry, and by philosophy, as in our lesson on spirit. Before there was a visible universe which we call nature, there must of necessity have been an invisible universe which we call spirit or power. The orderly way in which it arranged the visible universe which it created shows that it was and is a wonderful intelligence. Since spirit was and is all, it had nothing else than itself out of which to make a world. It therefore had to fashion a substance for its own body, the universe, out of itself or spirit. Since spirit is intelligence of necessity, the substance which it brought forth must share its nature. And all life must manifest the life of spirit since it proceeds from it. All science is agreed that life has never been discovered that did not come from antecedent life so that we can move back from the life of nature to the life from which it is derived, or nature's God, 
accordingly. Nature and the life in nature are one and the same thing. And we live in a universe which is literally alive. 2. We see therefore that this universal intelligence is also creative. It is the power that makes things and is the intelligence that molds original substance and holds it in form. As in man, the subjective or impersonal mind builds new life cells day by day and takes care of the growing life of the child and the renewing life of maturity. So in nature, the creative mind is busy building ever more stately mansions for its dwelling place. New universes are being flung out across the vast abyss of space. New stars begin to gleam as they launch out on their ageless journey around some distant sun. The earth upon which we tread is growing daily through the addition of cosmic dust and daily changing in its internal structure. New forms of life are appearing or old are altering. Flowers are blooming into life to breathe their beauty on the breast of nature. And we live in a world of life, ever renewing, ever changing, ever evolving into higher expression of the exhaustless energy of creative mind. The second part of our law therefore calls attention to the fact that we not only live in a world of intelligence, but that this intelligence is constantly creating. Behold, I make all things new. In this is man's hope and his power to act. This life is the life of the creative spirit, intelligence, or mind, and therefore we perceive that it emerges into form to enjoy its own power to live. When we think it is spirit thinking through us, when we utter a truth, it is spirit putting out into expression a thought from its limitless power to think. When we breathe, it is spirit breathing us. 3. This creative intelligence acts upon the impress of the strongest impression, thought, or image made upon it. When man emerges in consciousness out of this vast sea of life, as a wave runs upon the bosom of the ocean, he rises sufficiently high to enable him to perceive that there is an ocean. Thus, spirit fulfills a purpose in becoming man by enabling itself through becoming the particular to perceive itself in its allness. Man is spirit come forth out of the formless into form, out of the timeless into time, out of the limitless into certain limitations, and yet, as man, spirit never loses its power to draw upon its resources as spirit. Therefore, we must recognize that all the power of the universe is back of the mind of man when he thinks. Then, too, we must recognize that there cannot be a will in the universal mind opposed to man. For if there were, then he could not draw from the creative mind and power what he wants except by chance. We therefore recognize that so far as we are concerned, there is back of us a universal creative mind which desires to become to us whatever we desire. That is whatever we think into it and which has no purpose of its own opposed to ours as it creates a world by thinking a world for mind can act only through thought. So it creates for man himself whatever he desires by acting as creative mind upon his thought. This mind, therefore, is in his aspect purely impersonal and neutral. It has no purposes of its own as opposed to ours. It is creative activity, infinitely susceptible, responsive to our every thought, and is the power that brings into existence, in form, whatever we fashion in thought. We therefore perceive that whatever we think must make a greater or lesser impression on creative mind, and that when we consciously use our knowledge, we make an image of the thing we desire, 
then we present it to the great creative intelligence which begins to act upon our suggestion to bring forth our good into visible form the purpose of this is in the main to show the various phases of the activity of this law the law of creative activity by which the creative mind brings into form whatever we present to it sufficiently forcefully in thought four but there is one other feature of the law which must not be overlooked this is what we may term the personal side of spirit's activity while as law it acts in the manner we have just described and while so far as the individual will is concerned it does not act contrary to our purposes still it also acts as a law of tendency it tends to the production of higher manifestations of itself in individual expression and form it is seeking its own self-expression since there can be no other motive of creation at all its nature is life love and wisdom this it seeks to manifest accordingly it stands back of man as the source of his life love and wisdom and is ready to teach us all things and guide us in the way of truth it not only creates therefore according to the thought we impress upon it as law or impersonal mind but it becomes the director of man's thought and life whenever we turn to it for guidance and direction in our affairs this is in accordance with the three principles just outlined for as infinite wisdom it takes the impress of our desire for wisdom and brings that out into expression just as it does life and form we perceive this intelligence therefore as the source of man's inspirations and intuitions when we turn to it for guidance it becomes our teacher and guide when we turn to it for love it becomes our lover the greatest achievement of our own highest intelligence is therefore to be found in so harmonizing ourselves with this great life love and wisdom that we may find it in us as a perennial spring the water of life surging up eternally from the depth of our being whosoever believes on this spirit of life from within him shall flow springs of living water make a study of all the facts you know in relation to this great law restate it in your own words learn it in some such form as this one live in a universe of intelligence in which everything is alive and infinitely responsive to thought since it takes its form out of the substance of mind through the process of thinking two this intelligence is the creative factor in all nature and in the molding of all thought into form three it creates according to its own thought and accordance to the strongest impression or image of thought of the individual mind four it is the source of my life and understanding and impresses its nature and wisdom upon me as i allow it through my intuitions therefore i control my life and conditions by the thoughts i think since the universal mind acts creatively on my every thought i am through my power of thought master of my fate realization meditate on the above law think how your life has been controlled either by your own thinking or by the suggestions that have been made upon your mind either consciously or unconsciously when you were a child you took your thought from your family your world was what you made it but it was an unconscious acceptance of the thought and manners of your family after a while you began to think independently and your world changed that much for you you began to control consciously the conditions of your life as your understanding grew you thought more and more independently of your associates therefore your life became that much different from theirs did you continue to accept the suggestions of your environment or did you begin to think independently either consciously or unconsciously you are now conditioning your life i will now take conscious control of my life i will think only the things i want to think i will control whatever is to come into my life by controlling my thought i will daily mold my thoughts into finer form 
that creative mind in me and around me may bring forth a world for me of fair form. I will think thoughts of truth that I may be guided by supreme wisdom. I will think thoughts of faith that I may have the peace of God that passeth all understanding. I do now so think I am filled with the spirit of love. I am in harmony with the divine mind. I am open and receptive to the highest feelings. I do now consciously contact the mind of love and wisdom. I wait on the Lord that he may renew my strength. My mind is stayed on thee, and I am at perfect peace with all men and with myself. No evil can befall me, and the angels of love are round about me. Conscious of the godlike qualities of my soul, I go my way today in the strength of the infinite. I walk upon the earth as master and not as slave. I keep the law, and the law keeps me. I obey the law, and the law obeys me. I give my heart to God in divinest joy of self-giving, and I feel the helping hand of God upon me. I am glad. I am strong. I am full of life and love today. How to use the law. The best results are to be secured by using the law so far as we know it, while at the same time looking for more light. The student who approaches this subject for the first time has yet little to work on, for he has not tested out the law by science and experience. But enough has been said to make us realize that the object of a treatment is to impress our desire on the creative law with sufficient force to register in the creative mind. If the law creates for us according to the thoughts we think into mind, then what we must do is to raise our consciousness to the highest pitch of expectancy so that the best results may be secured. Accordingly, we must realize that the first thing for us to do in a treatment is to impress our own mind with the feeling that we are about to act upon the law and that it is about to act for us. The right atmosphere for a treatment, therefore, is that of high faith, so that we will do well to bring ourselves up to the proper pitch of expectancy by some preliminary reading. Take the Bible and read the precious promises in it. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. They that trust in the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. According to your faith be it done unto you. Ask, and ye shall receive. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. When ye pray, believe that ye have received, and ye shall receive. Go over these passages to guide you to strong faith. Learn some of the best ones one should memorize something daily, a verse, a stanza of poetry, a statement of truth. Everybody should know the 23rd and the 91st Psalm and be able to repeat it at such times as needed to strengthen confidence. It will also be of great help to read for a few minutes or longer in some helpful book of truth. The student may well read Creative Mind or Being and Becoming. The purpose of this is, of course, to furnish both instruction and inspiration. After hearing the lesson for the day, you will feel the truth more keenly. 2. Having prepared yourself in faith and knowledge, the course of your thought might well run along the line of the law much like this. I know that I am surrounded by the finer forces of spirit. I know that I am a center of conscious activity in this great ocean of divine mind. I know that my word has become the word of truth and a model of creation for the creative mind for the good I desire. Go on mentally meditating along these lines so long as you feel the interest or need. If necessary, overcome any feeling that may arise of fear or uncertainty. 3. Rid yourself of any sense of sin or fault. If you feel that you have done wrong in any way, seek to right it so 
that you may have a clear consciousness. If therefore thou art offering thy gift at the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother has aught against thee, cause for it in your wronging him, leave thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. These are the words of the master metaphysician and reveal the necessity of no counterthought against that of pure faith. If necessary, forgive yourself for anything you have done that you feel to have been wrong. The Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sin. You are a Son of Man. If you have fear, get rid of it in the same way. Cast it out. There is nothing to fear. Pull out all the weeds of wrong thinking. Declare that evil or the thought of evil has no influence over you. 4. Now feel as deeply as you can that all is well with you and the world. Feel how good it is to know this freeing truth, to know that you are a child of God, to know that all power is given unto me in heaven and on earth, to know that greater work than these shall ye do because I go unto my Father. Then say, I am pure spirit, living in a world of spirit and guarded by the great spirit of life. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I am now entered in spirit and in truth into the higher, finer places where I am in contact with all that is. I would see and know the truth and feel it at this hour. As a child of the living God, I make my claim upon the law. Let this good come to me. 5. Say distinctly and with deep feeling just what you want of the law. You are not dictating to it. But if you do not know what you want, the law has nothing to work on. At the same time, what you are after is the idea of the thing, so you may be sure that the greater wisdom will give you only the thing that will be for your best good, but it will be the thing you want and will be along the line for which you were holding the faith attitude. 6. Expect greatly, and you will receive greatly. Be strong in your faith, so strong that you feel in your heart that it is now done unto you even as you think and you can give thanks for it. Make known your request unto God with thanksgiving. In everything, give thanks. Be grateful. 7. For those who wish to develop spiritual perception, which is the basis of the highest healing power, it is desirable to dwell on the thought of spirit as a living presence, breathing in and through us, vitally interested in all our affairs and identifying itself with all our highest purposes and aspirations. The desires we have are then recognized as those of spirit, seeking its own self-expression. The love we have is the love of spirit in us, and the life is but the individual manifestation of that larger life in which we share. The true silence is the quiet realization of spirit with such intensity of feeling that we are merged in the great all and are one with the infinite mind. In this consciousness, we may secure the highest results by simply being still and knowing that the Father gives us all things even before we ask Him. Before they call, I will answer them. The Spirit knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask them. The final purpose of these lessons is nothing less than to bring up the consciousness of the seeker for truth to the point where the demonstration is made by simply knowing in his heart that the good he seeks is his now, simply because he has thought it. That is the way in which creative mind makes things, and in the end, that is the way we must secure them. We must know that our thoughts manifest as things. This will free us from all sense of struggle. This is the final piece of the soul and the great goal of individual life. To have the enjoyment of self-conscious existence and yet to rest in the infinite and eternal calm of the divine mind says edward roland sill tis not in seeking tis not in endless striving thy quest is found 
Be still and listen. Be still and drink the quiet of all around. Not for thy crying, not for thy loud beseeching, will peace draw near. Rest with palms folded, rest with thine eyelids fallen. Lo, peace is here. Realization I rise to the work and the life of the new day with strength and courage. I go forth with eagerness to my task. I go gladly, blithely on, for at the heart of me God presses in to keep me full supplied with all I need. I will not today lose conscious contact with the life of the Spirit in me. I shall know all day that beneath me are the girders of the Almighty, underneath are the everlasting arms. Whatever comes to me cannot find me unprepared. If I need wisdom, I have it. If I need courage, I possess it. If I need strength, it is within. My inner life is one with God. From within me flows streams of living water. The Spirit of Truth shall teach me all things and guide me in the way of the truth. I am held in infinite security. I have the wonderful poise and strength of one who is conscious of his inner source of strength. Men who see me today shall wonder at my outbreathing force and magnetic power. But I shall know that it is because the strength of the infinite is in me. So be it. So what we can get from these simple teachings is a powerful consolidation of the idea of the law of attraction. You must understand the way to enter into the mindset of the law is that everything around you is alive. This is something that's emphasized in a lot of the teachings that they have. They always refer to the substance. And what they're really referring to is the light. Everything that makes up all the mass and material around you is vibrating particles of energy that you have the ability to mold with your mind as it interacts with the universal intelligent mind. There's a universal intelligence with this. That is the key fundamental element. This universal intelligence is creative. It is the power that makes all things and we are connecting to it. It acts upon and impresses of the strongest impression thought or image made upon it. So we imagine a blank film and our thoughts are being projected onto this blank film and if you can add your thoughts with desire it adds a certain strength and oomph to this process of entering into the substance and it changes the reality around you the emphasis is that you are a divine focal point of this power that it moves through you and acts through you. And when you become aware that you are the divine focal point of this ocean of intelligence that you are walking within, then you have the easiest of tasks to create your reality with thoughts that you impress upon this substance. This mind that we are within is impersonal. It does not judge responds to the way that you think. I thought there were some pretty good affirmations at the end of these little sections that I read, and I'll definitely go back and read these for myself in the future, and maybe I'll make a meditation around some of these. But it is important to affirm that I will think thoughts of truth, and that I will be guided by supreme wisdom, that I will think thoughts of faith, that I may have the peace of God that passeth all understanding. When you affirm that no evil can befall me and the angels of love are around me, and I keep the law and the law keeps me, if you continually affirm that, then you overcome the vagaries and unusual obstacles that come up on a daily basis when you interact in the world with your thoughts and the law. Please let me know 
your particular thoughts on this reading and I can certainly share some more interesting advanced teachings from Fenwick L. Holmes. He teaches on a variety of things. Is evil a power? Creative imagination? Faith? The personal spirit? How to do treatments? What kind of cases to be treated? So I'll definitely return to that if you guys like this particular style of writing. I find it to be almost identical to Ernest Holmes. Obviously, they were family. You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. Check out my art at newearth.art and welcome to The Reality Revolution.